So I want to talk to you today about fossils and feathers. Now, as a mammal, I suffer from considerable feather envy, because comparing hair to feathers is a bit like comparing a rotary landline to the new iPhone. One is just a lot more complicated, comes with more built-in features than the other. Now, this particular feather is a primary. It's from the wing of a golden eagle. And you can see it's got a central rachis, which is hollow, and runs all the way up to the tip. Now, the rachis is flexible, so it can be bent, but then springs back into shape. And branching off from the rachis, there are various filamentous barbs. And those barbs you can see in this feather are asymmetrical. That is, they're much longer on one side than on the other. And that's because this feather is specially adapted to contribute to the lift-generating form of the wing. Now, collectively, the barbs form a cohesive sheet of material because branching off from them, there are little barbules. And branching off from the barbules, there are tiny hooks. And these hooks act like Velcro, holding the barbs together. So if you like, it's possible to un-Velcro a feather and peel the barbs apart. But if a feather's torn like this, it's a simple matter for the bird to come along and Velcro it back together. Cheap and easy repair. That's one point for feathers over iPhones. Now, as a paleontologist, I'm fascinated with how complex structures like feathers can evolve. And I'm going to come back to feathers specifically in a moment. But first, let me introduce you to a metaphor that paleontologists and evolutionary biologists use to help them wrap their minds around the complex process of macroevolution. So imagine if we could plot across two axes, all the possible variations in traits that would be possible for organisms to evolve. And I mean everything. We would plot the sharpness of claws, the length of claws, the width of claws, of eyeballs, of skulls, of tails, everything. Now, of course, we can't do that. There's probably an infinite number of forms organisms could theoretically evolve. But that's OK, because it's a metaphor. And then. Across a third axis, we plot the corresponding fitness values. That is, how much those traits and combinations of traits aid an organism, how beneficial they are. Well, naturally, most of the theoretical menagerie that we would dream up would be doomed, because they're just mismatched abominations of traits, unfit for survival, let alone survival of the fittest. But some traits work really well together. The combination of thick digging claws and a long tongue lets an anteater scratch out an existence as a successful insectivore. And so the result is a hill and valley landscape where beneficial combinations of traits create towering mountains of high fitness value. Now, as organisms evolve, they traverse this fitness landscape. And it's a landscape in which gravity works in reverse, because the process of natural selection pushes you ever uphill. So imagine an evolving population hanging out in the adaptive lowlands. Well, it moves around a little bit, just thanks to random genetic drift, la -de -de -da -de -de -da, until it happens upon a slope. That is, some mutation introduces a beneficial trait. Perhaps the ribs get a little bit thicker, providing better protection when a predator bites you. Well, upwards, natural selection pushes you. Those ribs get thicker still. They develop into armored plates. Up you go. And then the plates develop into a full shell. And you know what goes great with a shell? The ability to tuck your legs and head and tail inside of it until eventually, what have you got? You've got a turtle. Now, once you get up there to the peak of turtliness, there's only so far you can go. If your shell gets bigger and bigger still, oh, it starts to be too heavy, it starts to be too costly, you would start to slip 
off the other side. Natural selection doesn't let that happen. Those bad mutations are weeded out. It holds you there in place back towards the peak. Now, I don't mean any offense to turtles. One of my best friends is a turtle. True story. Um, but turtles are probably not the pinnacle of evolution, by which I mean their particular combination of traits probably does not afford them the highest possible fitness values. Somewhere in the adaptive landscape, there are probably taller peaks. But how do you get to them? Once you're stuck on, on one peak, the same forces that drove you up to it are now holding you stuck in place. You are effectively marooned in the adaptive landscape. Well, if you can't roll off the edge to reach another peak, maybe you can get there in one enormous jump. That is, maybe you could have a sudden, really big mutation that so drastically changes what an organism is like that you wind up somewhere else in the landscape. Now, of course, most such jumps would put you at a point of lower fitness value, and that mutation would die out. But theoretically, you could happen to land somewhere on a higher slope. And once there, natural selection could push you all the way up to that new peak. This, though, is a little bit like how evolution gets depicted in the X-Men franchise. Right? Suddenly, teenagers have mutations that grant them cool CGI spikes or heat vision. And when Sir Patrick Stewart explains it, well, it sounds quite reasonable. Uh, but, uh, and there probably have been some instances where big mutations have introduced highly beneficial traits, but by and large, no, Sir Patrick, uh, that's not how it works. Evolution is a gradual process. And so the prevailing view is that once you're on your little peak, you are stuck until the landscape itself starts to change. Now, in nature, a lot can change. Other organisms can go extinct, habitats can be altered, there can be climate change. And what is advantageous today may not have such high fitness values tomorrow. In the face of, say, global warming, fur coats are out, swim fins are in. The peak that you're residing on can sink as others start to rise. And once your peak is totally gone, you're free to maneuver up to a new slope and reach that point. This perspective sees organisms as basically passive rafters riding a fluctuating adaptive seascape. But today, I want to argue to you that there is in fact a force that can push organisms off of their peak, plunge them into the adaptive landscape where they can stumble across higher slopes. And that comes to us all thanks to sex, sexual selection. <laughs> now, life does a lot of dumb stuff for sex. Sexual selection drives the development of all kinds of bizarre and flamboyant display structures and courtship displays, things that can actually be quite detrimental to survival. And sexual selection is like the fashion industry. It can favor novelty for the sheer sake of novelty, and it actively resists stagnation. Sexual selection also has a way of running away with itself. So females that happen to like males with big dewlaps, that's the neck hangy downy thingy on that iguana, will preferentially mate with males with bigger dewlaps. And that produces offspring that both have bigger dewlaps and have a mating preference for bigger dewlaps. And on it goes. Now, to explain how that could help you bridge to adaptive peaks, let me give you a hypothetical example. So, giraffes, of course, are well suited to browsing high. But it's known that in many social ungulates, they size each other up based on perceived height. And male giraffes engage in a behavior that's called necking. That's when the males swing their heads down and whap their romantic rivals with their skull like a medieval ball and chain. 
life does a lot of stupid stuff for sex. And so it's been suggested that sexual selection had a major role in the evolution of giraffes. To work you through that scenario, imagine an early proto-giraffe looking a lot like a deer, sitting happily on the peak for low browsing. But the lady proto-giraffes have a thing for tall guys, so giraffes start to get taller. Now, this is not good from the perspective of the entire species. It would be much better if everyone would just keep their heads down, because it costs more energy to grow tall, it's easier for predators to spot you. But for an individual giraffe, the reproductive benefits outweigh the survival cost, and sexual selection holds you aloft, it lets you hover over the adaptive landscape. Well, that could be it, but as it happens, Giraffes continued to get taller and taller until suddenly they intercepted a new adaptive slope. They got so tall that they rose above their browsing competition and gained access to a higher level of food resources. They met the slope for high browsing. Then sexual selection and natural selection combined forces to drive giraffes up to the lofty animals that we know of today. Now, is this really how giraffes evolved? Probably not. How would we know? That's the problem with this and a myriad of other examples we could dream up to evoke sexual selection to explain any number of bizarre traits we see in modern day animals. It is, I think, the challenge of paleontology to identify clear instances where a trait that has arrived for one function has then become a sexual display structure, and then has arrived at a third novel function. And that brings us back to feathers. Now, it has been 20 years since the debate over whether or not birds evolved from dinosaurs ended. And it's ended thanks to specimens like this. This is a little comsognathid dinosaur from China. And it is beautifully preserved in sediments containing fine volcanic ash. And that has given us fossils not just of the skeleton, but if you look closely, running down its back and across its tail, you can see that most definitive of all birdie traits, feathers. Now, we've since learned a great deal about how feathers and flight evolved in dinosaurs. And one of the first things we learned is how very wrong a lot of our early thinking was. For a long time, it was assumed that right from the beginning, feathers always had this broad, blade-like shape, and that they evolved in the context of flight. The thinking was, Feathers were essentially raised scales that had developed on the arms of some sort of tree-dwelling reptile that jumped from branch to branch and benefited from longer and longer scales to help it glide. Well, if you take a look at the early feathers of dinosaurs, you can see that is clearly not the case. These are not blade-like scaly feathers. In fact, these are loose, filamentous, shaggy dino fuzz. These feathers are much more similar to hair than they are to scales, and they're undoubtedly serving the same function that mammalian fur serves, to hold in body heat. Now, we do have dinosaurs with flight feathers. This is the little raptor, Microraptor, about the size of a hawk. And you can see it's got long, asymmetrical flight feathers on its arms, forming primitive wings. A Microraptor is a dinosaur that lived in the trees and did leap from branch to branch and use its early wings to help it glide. It was living a lifestyle fairly similar to a modern flying squirrel. And that, by the way, is how I encourage you to think of raptor dinosaurs. Don't imagine them as scaly members of Chris Pratt's biker gang. Instead, think of them as feathery, terrifying dinosaurian super squirrels. So, there exists a big gap, a gap between simple feathers for insulation and highly complex feathers useful in flight. In the adaptive landscape, we've got early dinosaurs, fuzzy ones sitting on the peak for insulation, and birds way over there 
on the peak for flight. There's a gap in between them. And this gap has been filled. It's been filled by animals like this. This is the tiny oviraptor soar Caudipteryx. It has got complex fans of feathers on its arms and on its tail. But they're not flight feathers. They're not asymmetrical. Caudipteryx cannot fly. It's strictly a land-bound dinosaur. So what's it doing with these stiff, blade-like feather fans? Well, today, many ground birds make use of complex feathers, not in flight, but in courtship. Think turkeys, think peacocks. These little dinosaurs were probably doing the same thing. Broad arrangements of blade-like feathers on the arms and tail would have been perfect for flaunting and waving about. The gap has been filled by animals like this. This is a little Scansori opterygian. You can see faintly preserved is a fan of ribbon-like feathers. This is another dinosaur specifically adapted to answer the request, let me see you shake your tail feathers. <laughs> and it's been filled by ornithomimids. These are dinosaurs with linear arrangements of great plumes on their arms. And here it's known that those only grew in in adults. They're absent in juveniles, so they arrive upon reaching sexual maturity. So, these and other dinosaurs have filled in the gap and shown us that between insulation and flight, complex feathers for sexual display were widespread amongst dinosaurs. In the adaptive landscape, the scenario was this. Starting from the peak of dino fuzz, some feathers became flirtatious. They developed broader, more complex forms, arranged along the arms and tail to aid in flirting. But then, as it happened, in one group of tree-dwelling, raptor-like dinosaurs, it turned out that these flirtatious fans were also actually pretty good at helping you parachute and glide. And from there, it was upwards to birds that they soared. Now, feathers are complicated. They're complicated in terms of their structure, their function, and their evolutionary history. And I think they also teach us how important sexually selected bridges can be. Today, there are more than 10,000 species of birds. That's far more than us hairy mammals. And the success of birds is undoubtedly tied to their ability to fly. Flight really is a tall fitness peak. And it's one that could not have been reached without that bridge. So for dinosaurs, a little bit of sex appeal went a long ways. Thank you.